Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm proud to have joining us Coach Lamar Reddix from Milton Academy. In this conversation, we talk about Milton Academy, the school he's been at for 17 years. He grew up in Milton, playing for the local high school there, and then played at Bentley. And after that, immediately upon graduation, started coaching at Harvard. Did that for seven years, and while he was there, Jeremy Lin was there. Then he went to Boston U, and since then he's been at Milton Academy, and he talks all about you know, his school, the future of prep school basketball. He's had five D1 players in the past two years. He talks about placement strategy and much, much more. So sit back and enjoy our conversation with Milton Academy's coach, Lamar Reddix. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Lamar, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me, Corey. Yeah, it's good to have you on. I know we did a roundtable with a couple other coaches a few months ago, and uh, with some of the great advice you shared, I wanted to make sure we got you on here just to delve in more about you in Milton Academy. But you grew up in Milton, Massachusetts. You were a very good high school basketball player there. And I think we're about the same age. And so you went to high school in the early to mid nineties. Mm -hmm. If you were such a stud at Milton high school, how come no prep schools scooped you up or how come did you even look at prep schools as an option back then? I would have never even thought about prep school at that point in time. I, I had such a really great experience growing up with the high school teammates that I grew up with. We were, we played together since we were like in fourth grade. So um, when we got to the high school, we, I mean, we, we called plays, but we didn't have to, we, we just knew how to play with each other. Gotcha. But was prep schools even a thing back then? Like, did, what, did wasn't you hear... a thing. I mean, Milton Academy was steps away from I mean, a mile down the road from where I went to high school. And, um, you know, I didn't wouldn't even thought twice about coming here at that point in time. Okay. And you ended up choosing Bentley. Who else were you looking at and what led you to choose that school? Yeah, you know, my road was uh, very different than most kids nowadays. So, like, I, I I was actually a fairly good football player, too. So, I had had Division One football schools looking at me, but I had, had no love or interest in playing football at the next level. Um, all of my high school friends who I keep in contact with now are all football players. And so mm. – um, it's it's pretty odd, but um, you know I had like Penn State and Rutgers and schools like that recruiting me for football, um, and my basketball path came down to business schools. It was uh, Babson, Bentley, and Bryant were the you know basically the big three at that point in time that were looking at me really hard, um, and Stonehill at the time before they were Division One. But it came down to like right even before this, I actually had breakfast with my high school, with my college coach from Bentley um, this morning. So um, and a, a player right now, a, a former player from Bentley, uh, just worked out my son just you know fifteen minutes ago. So uh, my Bentley connections are very strong. Now tell me about for people that don't live in New England. Tell me a little bit about. Did any 10 conference and Bentley and kind of that style of basketball and that level of basketball? Yeah. Cause it's very familiar in the Northeast yeah. prep school world, but maybe outside that region, people don't know as much about yeah, it. Yeah. So. It's, it's a, it's one, it's a, a hell of a league. I mean, it, it is, has high caliber players. Um, a lot of their players now are getting scooped up and, and signing big time NIL deals for division one schools. Um, you know, I think what I always tell people there is like, they're usually kids who get overlooked um, at the division one level, they go play at, you know, this high brand of basketball division two. And, you know, like probably my case, you know, I was a six, two power forward, um, that, that wasn't cutting it at BC. <laughs> so, you know, Bentley became a really good option for a player like myself, you know, um, you know, I, I had a buddy of mine who was a division one player at the time. And he always talked about like, he goes, I played with you for so many years and I played in division one. I, I go, I didn't have anyone nearly as good of a basketball player as you were. Uh, just, you know, I think a lot of those kids get looked over. You know, I think when, when those kids end up becoming juniors and seniors, they're better than any division one high school, um, you know, freshman coming in, you know, so they're just kids that take a little bit longer to develop or mature into their games. Um, it's kind of what, 
the prep school world is now um, in terms of, you know, I think, you know, some kids who come to me are a year or so away from blossoming into who they really are going to be. And, um, and that's why coming to a place like Milton is a really good choice for um, a lot of kids because it has an opportunity for you to be able to develop into your body, um, tighten up some things in your game and allow you to have an opportunity to be able to, to, to play basketball at a, at a pretty good place. Well, now that you mentioned Milton, why don't you tell us about Milton Academy and kind of fill us in on like the elevator pitch, like tell us what makes the school special, why kids should come there and play basketball. Give me the full pitch. Yeah. You know, I think, I think we've been very competitive during my time here. Um, you know, I would say, we are usually in the conversation for competing for a um, class eight championship. Um, you know, this will be my 16th year coaching in, in the league. Um, and you take out COVID, you know, um, I think 11 out of those 16 years, we've been in the conversation for a, you know, class eight championship. You know, we've had talented teams to, to compete at that pretty high level. Um, academically, the school speaks for itself. It's one of the better you know, academic schools in the country. Um, so you're going to, you're, there's not many places where you're going to find the combination of athletics and um, academics uh, that we provide. And, and I think that's what makes this place pretty unique. And I always tell people what happens and, and I'm the athletic director here as well. So I tell people all the time, when you come to school here, you know, you're going to be around like-minded kids, kids who are going to be, competitive in the classroom, but also competitive in the dorms and, and just kids who are going to be mo highly motivated guys who are all going in the same direction. So whether your roommate is a football player or ice hockey kid, um, you got you got guys who are uh, committed to their crafts and committed to getting better and working hard to become the, their best version of themselves. Yeah, I love that. Now, you said your class A. Some class A teams have post grads and you guys don't. How we does do that balance out for you? <laughs> um, so we need to identify kids earlier um, before they have probably blossomed into who they're going to become. And I think that's probably one of the things that I think I've during my time here is I've been able to see the kid that I think that could use an extra year um, and, and and be able to use this place as as a as a venue to be able to develop into the player that they want to become so um so for us like i i need to do the early work um you know instead of getting a kid who is everyone has identified them already as hey they just need another year and they're going to be pretty good or um we we need to kind of get them that step before that and kind of really develop you know we just graduated a kid to, to go play at Boston College, a kid to go play at Purdue, a kid to go play at Harvard, and a kid to go play at uh, Princeton. And all four of those kids, when they came here, not a single person identified them as a top player. Um, and during their time, and another kid the year before that, that's at Richmond. So those five kids all came pretty much at the same time, and none of them were nationally ranked or even in ranked in New England or anything like that. Um, but, uh, you know, I think we did a great job, my coaching staff, of finding kids who really love basketball and want to get better and, and embrace coaching. And um, and these kids developed here. And, and again, like I wish I could sit here and say, listen, it, it's all me and I did all this thing. No, these kids get into the gym and work on their crafts. They, they, they you know, again, like just just a while ago, you know, I have one of my kids who who plays at Yale and one of my kids who plays at Richmond in the gym with my son working out like, you know, this, this gym is used all the time, 6 AM to 10 o'clock at night. There's kids in here playing summertime, you know, during the school year, like we have kids who are here all the time who want to get some runs in and get, get, some, get up shots and get better. And that's, that's how you do it. There's no magic pill. There's no, you know, a formula that I can craft up for you. You, you know, you have to be able to want to do the work, do the lonely work that we talk about. 
All right, so you got these five kids that went to the D1 level. Are you actively looking for them? Are they coming to you? Are people recommending them to you? Tell me your process of finding underclassmen. Yeah, I would say it's a little combination of all, all of that. Like, you know, we have some kids that I identify. We have some kids that someone says, hey, you know, this would be a you know, really good fit. You should take a look at this kid. And um, so, you know, I take it, you know, however it comes to me, you know, and, and I'm around the game enough that I'm going to, you know, see a lot of kids throughout the, my travels and, um, and meet a lot of families. And then there are families that are recommended to me as well. And um, so, I, you know, I, I use every resource that I possibly can. And I, I'll continue to keep looking under rocks and under pebbles and under stones to try to figure out who the next kid is for our program. And are most of your team, are they from the New England area, East Coast area, or are they worldwide? Yeah, I would say worldwide. I think during my time here, we've we've had kids from you know uh, international kids. We've had kids who live in the town of Milton. I, that, I mean, that's how bizarre um, it's been here. Like you know, it's such a wide stretch that we try to cover in our program. And like you know, one of the kids who just you know worked out who was at Yale, he lives two miles down the road from school. Um, and wow. you know, he had started off at Northwestern and transferred to. Um, Yale, and he was a top, you know, 75 player in the country when he graduated. Um, and then we have, you know, like Cormac Ryan, who's a kid who is from, you know, New York City, who's who was looking for a place to, to play. And again, another kid who probably thought he was under recruited and like had a chip on his shoulder. So those are the type of kids that we have. They kind of got a little bit of a chip on their shoulder, uh, want to be known as good basketball players. And they come here with that chip and, and i and i guess that's kind of who i am my my, my personality is that way as, as well and so uh, i feel like there's always something to prove and so we have a bunch of kids who are like-minded in that and, and enjoy competition and we when i first got here at the program we weren't very good at all um you know i think the year before i got here they didn't win any games and maybe the year before that they won three games and so uh, we this was a total rebuild when we got here, and I enjoyed that challenge of um, making this into a program that's respected. And um, I remember my first year, we only won like six games or something like that. And I think I went to my athletic director. I, I was the assistant athletic director at the time, and I went to my athletic director and said, can you take these games off the schedule? He's like, that accounts for more than half of your wins last year. I said, I know. If we're beating them, we shouldn't be playing them. Um, so – uh, you know, so that's when I added the Andover, the Exeters of the world, and the Chotes of the world to to be on our on our schedule to play top caliber teams. Because if we're ever going to be a top caliber team, we got to start competing against them. So um, that's my mindset. We've never shied away from trying to play against good good teams. You know, we played Brewster two years ago um, in an incredible game here, um, and we're just not going to ever run away from people. We we want to play against the best. And that's the only way for us to get better. Yeah. Love that. Now go back to the, you not having prep postgrads to the person out there that doesn't understand reclassifying postgrads. How do you, how do you explain that to them that you will be playing other teams with postgrads on it? Yeah. Well, you know, so, you know, I, and again, I always tell this, you use what you can. All of our schools are so unique and very different that you use whatever you can to sell your school, to elevate your program. And for us, we can't use postgrads, which is very rare in Class A. There's not many schools in Class A. When I think when we won the Class A championship two years ago, we were the first school to do it that didn't have postgrads. Um, and that's unique, and that's odd, and that's different. But at the same time, I got kids to reclassify. So they came, they finished their sophomore year at their public high school, and they redid their sophomore year here at Milton. Now, a school like Milton, you know, we don't have just the traditional English class. We probably have like 15 different English courses that you can take more similar to a college um, where there's electives and there are, you know, so you can keep progressing in, in that in that way and that you're not retaking any, any of your core classes that you've already taken, but you are still progressing um, as a student. And so a lot of our kids come here, they do that. Um, and so, so we do have older kids on our team, so it's no different than, um, you know, uh, you know, some other schools that, that are allowed to take PGs. Now, the only thing I, I tell people that's different is that I have to identify this kid when they're 14 yeah. years old and not 18 years old, you know, um, that this kid has a chance to be pretty good if he has another year. 
Um, it's pretty clear when you're 18 years old and you've developed and you've grown into this body that you're like, oh, yeah, you're going to be pretty good. You, in one more year, you might be really good. Um, you know, trying to figure out that when they're 13, 14, 15 years old is can be a little bit more of a challenge. But those, like I said, those are the challenges I, I love and I embrace and, and, and really do or try to try to do a great job of trying to identify those kids who are also looking for that same challenge here as well. Yeah, and the benefit for you too is you've got kids for multiple years, not just coming in and out for and nine months is, at a time. Corey, I think you bring up a really good point. I think it's a it's it is a really big benefit to us is that we get kids here for at least two years, if not three years. I think I found the sweet spot has been that ju- that sophomore year, the kid who mm-hmm. reclassifies as a sophomore. This league is so you know we we compete in the, in the independent school league, the ISL, and then we are in Class A, and both the ISL and Class A are just Literally with great coaches, great players, and it's just a really, really hard league. Like you know, both of them are, and um, that first year is challenging to most. Even if you're a really good basketball player, it's a challenging year to to get used to the speed, um, the high level of games, and, and high level of everyday practice. Forget about the games um, that you're going against somebody good every single day in practice. Um, so. It usually takes about a year for a kid to figure it out. And then in year two, they usually are, are a lot better. But if you get year three, you're a lot, lot better. <laughs> you know, you've, you've figured this out. You've been through battles and you have a really good grasp of what it takes to be excellent in this world. And so um, so it's, it, it is, a, to me, it is a, it's, a, it's an advantage for, for sure. Absolutely. Now, some families will ask me, hey, what, do we, what about AAA, AA, single A, B? Like, does it matter what? what league I'm in. And so my I, thought is always, yeah, just pick based on the coach you like the best yeah. and it doesn't matter what level it is, but what do you say to people that ask you about comparisons and does it matter if a kid's playing a versus double A or triple? So, you know, you, I could probably get into this for a longer, I, I, I speak at many camps throughout the course of the country. And I, a lot of times I talk about, um, and I'm talking to high school kids usually at this point in time, you know, thinking about college. And I always tell them, don't fall in love with a Roman numeral there are good basketball players no matter where you go. Like, you know, you we can go down the street to, you know, a litter of Division three schools in this New England area, and it is great basketball that you will watch at the Division three level, and especially in the Northeast. There's so many, so many colleges, and, there's, you know, there's so many good coaches and, and teams. And and, um, and then, you know, like we just talked about Division two. I, I coached at Harvard and BU. Um, before coming here. And at both places, we scrimmaged Division Two teams and would get our butt kicked by Division Two teams. Um, so, you know, when and a lot of those times it was Bentley, uh, oddly enough, and I, and I know I just talked a little bit about them, but, you know, but it, they have good players, and that's that's the reality of it, and especially when those Division Two teams are older. They're really good. They're not just good. They're really good. And so um, same thing with Class A, Double A, and Triple A, like, I'm, I'm going to tell you that like there are a lot of class A teams that can compete with some triple A teams and and vice versa. So I think, you know, trying to find the right fit overall for your kid in a place that you're going to get playing time is probably what I would consider to be the two most important things uh, because you, you want to go to a place where you can play. And I also, I've, I've, I've turned away really good basketball players when I've had stronger teams because I can't play everybody, you know, um, yeah. you know, and, and that's not fair to that kid. If he wants to be recruited and be seen by college coaches, well, they're not coming to every practice that we have. And that's where that kid might get be the most valuable for us that in particular year. Um, they need to be seen. And so trying to find the right fit um, where you can go somewhere where you have an opportunity to be able to play is really important. Um, and then finding the right coach and the right school um, that fits your child is super important. Yeah, collegiate and prep school level. Yes, Same thing. both both places. All right, we're going to play a little game here called Probably. Name the Famous Alumni. All right. <laughs> so some Wikipedia pages are thicker than others. Yours is pretty thick, so you should get all three of these. All right. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy. Oh, right here. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, we, was, we – good. Yeah, who is, who is he for those that don't know, for the two people that don't know? For the two people that don't know, uh, he has a very established uh, – uh, line of credit in terms of being a president and, and being a, a person in this area and went to going to school here at Milton Academy. Okay, perfect. 
Next up, T.S. Eliot. Another graduate from Milton Academy. Uh, I don't know his background as well, but I mean, you know, this place is just, I, I actually went to dinner last night with a couple of alums and they just, it's just amazing what, what people do when they graduate from this place. Yeah. Famous writer, poet. And then last one, James Taylor. Oh gosh, his kids were just here. Well, I shouldn't say just here, maybe about five or six years ago. And so it was pretty incredible to have him on our campus. So a famous musician, um, you know, sells out Fenway anytime that he comes into town. Uh, and as a, you know, a, a fan of him and his music and um, to see this guy walking on campus was, <laughs> was, it was, was kind of awesome in some ways. Like, and he just blended in. So he was another alum. His kids went to school here. It was pretty cool to have him around for uh, the few years that I, that his kids went to school here. Any other cool alum that we should mention? Gosh, we have so many of them. I don't, if I name one, someone's going to be mad. I didn't name them. So, um, okay. it's, a, it, you know, I think, I think if you have the opportunity to be able to go to a school like this, you're a cool alum, put it that way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for playing uh, the alumni game for Milton Academy. You were, uh, we'll give you three for three. So there you job. go. Um, let me ask you this. When you graduated from Bentley, you ended up at Harvard. How many years between Bentley and Harvard? Did None. you go right away? Or, right no, away. So straight out. Okay. 22 years old, Division One assistant coach, not knowing what I was doing. I still don't know what I'm doing. I guess sometimes I guess I say that, but um no, and that and that that was so the two people I had lunch with, I had lunch, I mean breakfast with this morning was my former coach at Bentley and then my the coach that I worked under at um Harvard, um, who are both very influential in who I am as a basketball coach to this day, um, how I run my program, things that I do. Um, they both really molded me into the adult that I am now and um they're mentors of mine and so I continue to keep you know, keep in touch with those two folks today. And, um, and, you know, my, my journey to being to where I am today doesn't happen without either one of those two guys or, or those experiences. Um, and so working at Harvard, you want to talk about famous alums. I mean, the same thing, like, I, you know, I, I always compare Milton to this mini Harvard in some ways. And it's interesting that we were sending a kid there this year, but it's, um, it's a, it's just a, outstanding institution and my time there was uh, i was there for seven years and it was an incredible seven years yeah and during your time you guys you recruited jeremy lynn so talk to me about that like did you have the crystal ball that you knew jeremy would be what he'd be yeah look at that for those not uh watching this right now he just pointed to a jeremy lynn uh jersey hanging in his office so That's thanks right. for showing that no, so Jeremy, about that. <laughs> Jeremy Lynn, I remember watching him play in the West Coast, and um, I think it was Las Vegas, the event I was in. And um, at that point in time, like, you know, you you know, you can watch a kid blow up, like, right in front of you. Like, he just has an unbelievable game in front of the right coaches, and you're like, holy cow, he just – we can't recruit him anymore. He just – he was having one of those games. I was like, sprain an ankle, go down. go Not 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 get hurt, like, hurt, hurt, but, like, don't play the rest of the half. You know, um so I, I had this inclination that he was going to be very good. I'd be lying to you if I told you I thought he'd be a pro. But, like, he was one of the kids. I only coached him for one year. Um, but during that year, like, he would leave practice, go to dinner, but he'd come back down and watch film or get up more shots or go to the weight room. He had a different drive and motivation. Um, and, you know, it's no wonder that it worked out for him the way it did. Um and I still think I still think about it all the time. Like, you know, the Lynn Sanity is one of the most incredible basketball runs of any yeah. individual has ever had in their lives. And um it was great to to somewhat be a part of that. You know, um I, I kept in contact with him because whenever we had a new crop of freshmen at that point in time I was a young assistant and so when they went over to the weight room and lift, I would always lift with the freshmen, kinda of get them going. Um and at that point in time I think I could curl more than he could bench. And um you know, I, I ended up taking him out his senior year um, for dinner. Uh, I wasn't I wasn't at uh, Harvard at the time, but I, I continued to take the kids out that I coached or recruited um, all the way up until that last crop. And we sat down, and he goes, "I'm now the strongest person on the team." Like so, he was a he was a kid that would take his weaknesses and make them into strengths of his, um, and which was pretty cool and unique and um, and. I don't think many people know the things that he does for like, you know, whenever he would play here in Boston, he would, he'd have these games and he'd have, um, he'd have like 
thousands of of uh, Asian Americans stick around after the uh, the game is over, and he would talk to to them all. Um, and he did that in multiple cities, and just to, you know, he he knew that he was destined for more than just being a great basketball player, but he was a really um, transformative person in that culture. And um, even that jersey that I have up here is when he was with the Warriors, where. Um, that jersey at that point in time was like the number two or number three selling jersey. And he wasn't even playing at that point in time. He wasn't even getting any burn. Um, it's just amazing that his influence on basketball at that point in time was, especially for Asian Americans, uh, Asians in general. But um, he was a transformative person for real. Yeah, and ironically, Prep Athletics started kind of basically when I went to Taiwan for the first time. Really? And the day I showed up uh, – you know, I was there on vacation by myself, and one of my buddies said, you should meet with the head of Nike basketball. So I got on the Nike headquarters in downtown mm-hmm. Taipei to have lunch, and it was the day after Jeremy Lin left at the peak of Lin Sanity, right? So he had Lin Sanity, then came to Taiwan, where his parents yeah. were born, yep. for like four days, and it was 24-hour coverage, like Princess Di was there. Oh, no doubt and about it. This Nike guy was exhausted because he had, you know, Jeremy was a Nike athlete, and... uh Taiwan had never seen anything like that in its anything history. Anything like it. Anything like right? it. So it's pretty neat that timing there. And now we got prep athletics based on Taiwan. So it's all a small world. But let's go back to your days at Harvard because playing in the Ivy League is kind of like the holy grail for a lot of players and families. And my mind has changed on that in a few years. And I want you to kind of back me up or shoot me down on this. But, you know, Putnam Science, which, you know, love those guys there. They're not known as an academic school. Mm-hmm. They've got a kid in the Ivy League now. And yeah. Harvard on their roster has a kid from a basketball academy in Arizona on their roster. Mm-hmm. So the Ivy League now, it doesn't really matter what prep school you go to. Yeah. Am I right to say if they want you and you qualify to get in, it doesn't matter where you're at, they're going to recruit right. you. They, Am I right they, or wrong on that? No, you're right. You're right. And, that, and that's that shifted, by the way. Because um, mm-hmm. I would tell you that at one point in time, that was not the case. So I would tell you. I, I tell people all the time I have very strong ties to the Ivy League, not just because I coach there, um, but um, and I've sent a bunch of kids there. But when I was a, an assistant coach there, we'd go watch a kid play, and there would be literally seven of the eight Ivy League schools sitting there watching the same kid play. Um, that's not the case anymore. There's a wider net that they're able to cast upon um, that – you couldn't do years ago. And so why is that? Let me pause you. Why is what changed? I think it just has become so much more competitive and that um, guys have to look in different areas and different places. And I also think there's, there's, there are more opportunities for kids to be able to do great work at Putnam science and do your work at a high level and have that be able to be uh, transferred to a, a, you know, one of the hardest schools to get into is, you know, it, you know, in the Ivy League now, which was different in, in back in the day. So um, so that paradigm has changed a little bit, you know, but I think it's um, it's better for the game. Um, I think the Ivy League, which I think, I, you know, not a lot of people know, but like, you know, they're usually like in the top. 12, 15 conferences in the country, um, there's a lot of schools that don't want to play them because they don't want to lose to Yale. Like, you know, more schools probably say no to scheduling Yale on their, on their you know, on their um, schedule because they're afraid to lose to, to these schools um, and look bad that they lost to an Ivy League school. Um, so those those schools are having – they have a hard time scheduling people. Um, the coaches in that that – and that league are tremendous from top to bottom. Um, and it's just a really, really dynamic and tough, you know, league with a lot of really good coaches and a lot of really good players. So it's been kind of fun to watch the evolution of that league grow. But the, you know, the popularity of that league, I think, um, you know, even just like the, the additions to the, the coaching in that league, it just makes it really, really um, a really fun league to watch and cover. And I, and I have a close glimpse of it um, here with Harvard being, you know, less, you know, half an hour away and Brown being an hour away. I can usually catch a game or two pretty easily for myself. And, you know, we have a player at Princeton. We have a player at Harvard. We have a player at Yale and the Dartmouth coach's son will be a sophomore here uh, at Milton this year. Um, and the other four Ivy League schools, you know, like, you know, the Brown coach was a player when I was uh, 
when I was coaching in the league and, um, and Steve Donu at Penn, I've just known him and that staff forever. When he was at BC, his first recruit was Dennis Clifford um, from here. And so my, my ties to that league are just are, are really, really super strong. And so um, I always tell kids if that's a end goal for you, this is a really good place to, to start. Yeah, and since you're so in tune with the league, I want to ask you this too. NIL, I know, has been a challenge with the Ivy Ooh. League due to the financial aid uh, situation that they've got. So is there any light at the end of the tunnel to make that work? Because you've got so many smart people there. I <laughs> think they'd come up with something creative, and maybe they have in the past few months that I don't know about. But tell me about NIL in the, in the Ivy League. So, I mean, I haven't done en- enough. Th- this is just my thoughts, really. I think that they're going to have to do something, right? So what happened this year, five of the best players in the Ivy League um, left and went to other institutions. Um, so if you leave, if you leave Yale and you go to Georgetown, is Georgetown that big of a drop off in terms of an academic institution? And they're also going to pay you, you know, two hundred k to go there, whatever they're they're paying their kids. Like, no. And you might start making decisions based on, hey, listen, Georgetown's still a pretty good school, but they're also paying me this amount of money too. So um, for some families that money is transformative for their, for those, for those families. Right. Like, and so it's hard to tell a kid, no, don't look at that. When I know the biggest thing when I was at Harvard, we would always tell people don't think about the next four years, think about the next 40 years. Right. Um, you know what? It's hard not to think about the next four years. If they're going to pay you pretty good money as a 19, 20 year old, uh, you know, student athlete. So um, if my guess is that at some point in time, the smart people in the Ivy league will f- have to figure out, whether they start giving scholarships and they have to start, you know, creating collectives and having the pay kids, which would be a really hard thing for a school, those institutions to want to do. But if they do do it, think about getting a Harvard education and somebody paying you and these schools have the resources to go out and create a collective that no other school may not, may ever be able to get, you know, so, it could be a game changer for them if they do it. It's also a game changer if they don't do it yeah, because no it, could really, it could really hurt them as a league. Yeah, I just think there's so many creative minds there. I don't know how they haven't figured that out yet, but I'm sure, they're, work, I'm sure well, they're working on it behind the scenes. So these, these creative minds, you're correct, but the, there is just such old school traditions at institutions like the Ivy League. Like those 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 eight schools, the ancient eight, they, they – they are stuck in their tradition and their traditional ways. And so it's hard to break that. Like, you know, the last league to have in um, a postseason tournament, uh, you know, was the Ivy league. Like, and you say, why is that possible with all these smart people around? But it took them a long time before there was an Ivy league tournament, you know? So um, they they'll figure it out. Um, it may not be as quick as we think it should be, but they'll figure it out because you know they're going to look at the landscape and um, and see that it'll make it really hard for them to compete if they don't do it. Let me ask you this. Uh, you've got these five guys in the past two years going D1. What's your process for placement? Not just your D1 guys, but guys even at the end of the bench. Is yeah. that a role you take? Is it the AAU coach? Is the family doing that? Walk me through how you at Milton do your placements. So I tell people this, and, and I will always coach as long as I love doing these three things. I love recruiting to Milton Academy. I have a great product to sell, so like that's that's not fair. There's a lot of people because you know if you come here on a day like today where the sun is out and and the campus looks as beautiful as it does today, like you come here and ha- it's really going to be hard for you to say I didn't like it. You know we're eight miles from Boston. We use Boston as part of our campus. So I enjoy the recruiting part of what I do. I really enjoy the coaching part of what I do, but I also love the college process part of what I do as well. Um, and, and as long as I love all three of those things, the way that I do, I'll continue to coach for as long as I can possibly do it. And I enjoy the college process part of this because, you know, I love seeing the end product and I love feeling like at some point in time I've helped this young man be ready for the next stage of his life and trying to find the right fit. And, and, and luckily for us, 90% of the kids that have left here have had the opportunity to be able to play um, right away as freshmen. 
Um, and and we, we really do hope that like it's part of what we do here is that we provide an environment that is competitive and also prepares you and I, for the next level, for the next stage of, of their lives. And so, um, but we also talk about the right fit quite, you know, quite a bit and what's the right place for um, our kids. And so um, we put a lot of work into that and a lot of conversations with the families, with the kids, with college coaches. Um, one of the things I try to pride myself on is not being a person that's selling my kids to other programs and having to create a market for them in terms of like me, you know, outwardly just saying, Oh, you should come look at my kids. You know, they see our kids play and then, and they like our kids and they want to get involved um, because they like what they see on the court, whether it's with my team or whether it's with their AAU program that they play for. And I'm usually work hand in hand with their AAU coach. Um, I don't have a particular AAU program that we, you know, just get our kids from. We let our kids play for whoever they want to play for. Um, but I, I, I tell this to people, I grew up in this area. I've coached college basketball in this area. I've coached AAU basketball in this, I mean, AAU basketball in this area. I've coached high school basketball in this area. So there's not many people I don't have really great contacts with. So um, so all the AAU programs, I know all the guys there. And so we, we are able to work together. Um, and we have a partnership in trying to find the best fit for our for our kids. Love it. Does it ever get weird with the Boston AU team since they are so competitive when you've got a good player and they all want them? Like yes. <laughs> that's that's true. Um and and that's and that's just I think that's gonna exist for a long period of time. I don't think that will change for a long period of time. You know, one of the things that, like I do, I don't get involved in telling kids that they should play for this AAU program or that AAU program. Um, you know, I, I, if you come to me and you are part of a program, I hope that you stay in that program. I, you know, I don't, I'm not trying to flip you to somebody else. Um, and, you know, it's a unique blend sometimes. And, you know, this year we'll have about four of the, you know, top five or six AU programs, kids playing for, for me. Um, and that's uh, a tribute to the kids who are looking at a good school like this, but also knowing that these AU coaches know that I'm not here to try to flip them to somebody else or anything like that. So gotcha. What's the future of prep school basketball, Lamar? That's a phenomenal question. Um, every year it gets more and more competitive. And, and I mm. love that by the way. Um, yeah. it, it, you know, I, I don't play anymore and um, I am a competitive person by nature. And so the coaching takes on that shape for me um, and it gets my competitive genes going and, uh, and, and it fuels me. So um, just in the ISL, the league that we are in, um, you know, I think I've you know, been you know, helpful in, you know, recruiting coaches, college coaches into coaching in our league. And so there's a lot of just a lot of really good coaches in prep school across the board um and there's a lot of really good players in prep school across the board and um from the going into my 17th year here at, at milton i just see it get better and better every year and then you start hearing of schools that you know that you never heard of before becoming really good programs um so it's just always going to be competitive and i just um i don't know i, I just think it's just going to continue to keep getting better i think people I think college coaches are looking at this and, and they're looking at it and they're thinking to themselves that, you know, this looks like a, a, a you know, better work-life balance. And so you're getting a lot of college coaches who are creeping into this world and um, which makes the coaching better. And, um, and that's fun. I think that's a fun thing for, for us, for me as a coach and, and it's good for the kids that they're getting good coaching. Like we, you know, we had the NEPSAC showcase about a month or two ago, and that was just phenomenal. Like, you know, to watch the talent, to watch the coaching. Um, um, and we're pretty blessed and lucky. If you play in the New England prep school league, you're, you're going to face good talent. You're going to have good coaching. And I think that's really valuable. And, uh, and for parents who are looking to, to make this, decision is just trying to find the best fit for mm -hmm. your child, which is what can be difficult too, because there's every school is so incredibly different. You know, the podcast that we were on when you, when we had a couple of other schools on there, the four schools that were on there couldn't have been any 
more different than each other, <laughs> you know, in yeah. terms of size, location, like, you know, you, you name it. And um, so there's just a lot of different options and just, you, you just try to explore them all and try to figure out um, what's the best fit. Yeah. And that's where my business got created, obviously. Selfish yeah. plug is that, you know, I know those differences between these schools and I help families navigate this world, which I can't imagine coming from the outside just by Same. Googling how you're going to know the difference between South Kent, Milton, uh, Fork Union, unless you really well, do a deep dive, talk to people, because they're all prep schools, right? Well, it is, and, and, and not every prep school is the same. And so That's it's, right. um, and it's, and it's amazing as, as I just said, like, you know, I, my son is on my team, right? And so um, navigating this process, even with him or with, uh, you know, talking to other guys who are in this business and know a lot about this business we still have challenges trying to navigate this whole entire thing. So it's, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, but, you know, again, I think trying to do as much research as you possibly can using your organization that, that the platform that you have, I think is incredibly smart of someone because there are so many questions. And I, you know, um, you know, I, I do this all the time for families where I just try to answer questions, especially when I've made, relationships with families that I know that Milton may not be the the right fit for them is trying to help them out uh, one way or another. Um, it, it just, it just can be very daunting. Um, it's no, it's actually no different than trying to look for college right now. Like it's, it's pretty much the same process now. Um, and you need to know, do I want to be in the city, near the city, outside the city, day school, boarding school, um, all boys school. Like there's, there's so, there's such a variety of different, programs and every school is not the same you know i don't think there's i don't think milton is like any other school um i don't think that andover and exeter are like any other school i don't think choate's like any other school like you know they're they're we're all so incredibly different i always say this as a i as a isl athletic director the 16 schools in our league and when we unanimously vote on something i'm always shocked i'm like there's no way that these 16 schools that are incredibly different with in with 16 different mission statements we agreed on something all together um because you know we have day school boarding school big school small school like all types of different things and everybody has their looking at this whole thing differently so it's uh it is incredibly difficult but trying to get as much research talking to you because you know all the schools you know all the coaches you know um you know the things that most people can't just find on the when they Google um, Milton Academy on the website, like that's just, that's just not going to be enough. And so trying to do a deeper dive, which I think your platform creates for people um, is really important. Absolutely. And that's why we have these podcasts too, with guys like yourself. So you might touch on some things with the family and your initial call with them, but this podcast, we're getting into your history, yeah. some of your philosophies, some mm -hmm. of your uh, extra nuggets, which I think families really find helpful while doing their due diligence. Yes. Um, Lamar, what does it take to play guard at the D1 level? Gosh, it's so hard now. Um, I think one thing that's super important at the guard level, you got to be able to shoot the ball now, as you see. Like the spacing, spacing has become so key in the sport of basketball. So if you can't shoot it, you almost can't play anymore. Um, you, know, if, you know, if you are a guy that can't make shots and teams can really help off you, that makes it very difficult because teams are – so dependent on spacing on the court now. Um, and the second thing is, you know, depending on what type of guard you are, if you are a guy that has a ball in your hands a lot, you got to really be able to handle the ball and, and not turn the ball over. Like, you know, that's my biggest thing as a, I think I tell people the point guard spot and the center spot for me are the two toughest positions to play for me because I expect so much from our point guard. At some point in time, me as the basketball coach here, um, I want to hand the keys over to my starting point guard and say, this is yours. Um, but to get to that point, we're going to have to go through a lot to get you there. Um, and you need to be able to see the game, feel the game, um, handle the basketball, take care of the basketball. Um, there's also, there's so many things to be able to do. But I think shooting is is such an important, whether you're a point guard or an off guard, you got to be able to shoot the basketball. Now. Love it. We're going to go through some quick hitters now. Okay. Best player you ever played against? Played against Dominique Wilkins. Where'd you do that? 
Um, there was a pro-am league in Boston uh, when I was in, in high school, and that's when Dominique became um, to the Celtics, which many people probably don't even remember that, but that was like the latter portion of his career. Um, he finished up here and uh, had to play against him. Him and Rick Fox. I, Rick Fox abused me in, a, in that wow. league one day, and that was um, the most demoralized I've ever felt as a basketball player. All right. Best player you've ever coached against, both in the college level and at the prep school level? Gosh. Um, to start at the prep school level, well, he's probably going to be the number one draft pick. So A.J. DePantis um, was at St. Sebastian's um, two years ago, and we beat them in our – they're in our league. We beat them in um, – uh, in our league game and we beat them in the championship game. Um, mm. And that kid's probably going to be the number one draft pick in the, in another year. And so that's, that's I'm not sure if it gets much better than that. Um, best player that I played against in college. I want to say coach against. Against. Uh, coach. I'm going to say best player I've ever probably coached was Jeremy Lynn because he was a pro himself. Um, so um and also, I just love the kid himself. He's a great family, great kid. I'll, yeah, I'll perfect. Go with perfect. What's your favorite movie? Uh, Remember the Titans. Okay. And Big what are your hobbies? Gosh. Um, well, I mean, it's probably no secret that I, I'm in love with the game of basketball. Um, you know, I would say just uh, I've, I've been trying to pick up golf. I'm not very good at it. And if I could be good at that, I would name that as one of my favorite hobbies. Um I, I really just enjoy trying to spend time with friends. Um, one, like I did this morning was connecting with, you know, two people who are very important to me, mentors to me. Um, throughout the course of the year, I try to connect with people who are important, you know, figures in my life, whether they're friends or they're mentors. Um, most of my players, I would tell you that in the course of a year, I probably connect with every single one of my players at some point yeah. in time, whether it's just – a simple text message or reach and pick up the phone and call somebody. Um, uh, I find that to be incredibly important to me. Um, this year we're trying to confirm, but we, we believe that this is a hundred years of Milton basketball. Um, and if that is the case, we're going to have a big party around here. Oh, that's great. Uh, is there anything you want to talk about that we haven't mentioned so far? No, I, well, I will just give you a plug and, and say thank you for doing this. I think, um, you know, you providing this resource for families is is incredibly important. And, you know, and I also like, you know, a big shout out to um, the coaches that you've had here and the coaches that you work with and help out with. Like it's, you know, it's I think what we do is incredibly important. And um, and I'm just blessed that there are there are so many good coaches out there and so many good options for um, our kids to be able to go play for and become better basketball players. Um, it's a really great fraternity that I feel like I'm a part of, and, and I feel blessed um, to be able to to say I've had a hand in, in helping out many kids, you know, reach some of their dreams and goals. So, love so, it. And if people want to reach out to you or follow you on the socials, well, that'll be in the show notes. But where can they do that? Uh, MA Boys Basketball on Instagram, and um, and feel free to, if there are questions you want to follow up with me, um, you can email me here at Milton Academy, Lamar underscore Reddix at Milton.edu. Um, like I said, I'm all, always happy to talk to people. Awesome. Well, we had Coach Lamar Reddix on from Milton Academy sharing his story, his background, his philosophy, and more about his school, and we appreciate it so much. So, Lamar, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Corey. All right, we'll see you guys next time. Take care.